Good evening, everybody. Well, hi. This is a, 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 a LSE public event, um, which is uh, uh, celebrating the launch of a new book by Professor Paul Kelly called Conflict, War and Revolution. And the event is organized by the LSE government department, uh, of which I used to be a member and of which Paul is a current member, uh, and uh, by LSE Press, for which I am the editor in chief. And LSE Press is uh, an open access digital press. Uh, although you can buy our paper copies of our books, our main job is to produce open access books that can be downloaded free of charge from anywhere in the world, any PC, any tablet, any phone. If you've got an internet connection, you can access the full text of our books with no uh, scouring of your data or anything else of that kind, just a, an instant free download of the book. And of course, we rely hugely on the generosity of academics and authors who are willing to uh, advance open social science, of which Professor Kelly is one. So let me introduce Professor Kelly and also our two distinguished commentators who we're very pleased to have with us, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Fraser and Professor Kimberly Hutchins. Now, Professor Kelly has been at the LSE government department for oh, quite a long time, almost as long as I was when I was there. Uh, but uh, he's a very well-known political theorist and political thought uh, expert. And um, he's also been a uh, pro-vice chancellor, pro-director of, uh, of the LSE for many years. And so he's an, a person who's very, very competent on lots of things that the rest of us can't hope to be including writing this wonderful book, which is the, the latest of his series of political thought books, of which the most recent was uh, The Magisterial Political Thinkers, published uh, five years ago with uh, David Boucher. And Paul has had a very distinguished academic career, including editing political studies, where he did all the work and I was sort of a little bit involved, and uh, ethics and various other things. Um, and we're very, very happy to have with us uh, uh, Elizabeth Fraser, who's the official fellow and tutor in politics uh, at New College Oxford. Wonderful college, wonderful job. I'm full of envy as I speak even now. Uh, and uh, Elizabeth has been there for uh, quite some time, since 1991. And one, we're very happy, very lucky to have her with us because her uh, one of her specialities is, is uh, politics and, and violence, and, um, and she also spans across between the politics and the philosophy faculties at Oxford. And also with us is uh, Kim, Professor Kimberly Hutchins from Queen Mary University, London. Um, Kimberly's uh, uh, an international relations uh, professor, and she's been at uh, Wolverhampton University, where she had her first job, and then Edinburgh, where she was head of department for a long time, um, and then came to LSE and was also head of department there. So really, you've over, you're, you're again, uh, something about political thought, it, it lends itself to running things, I think. Um, and she's uh, most famous for her book, Global Ethics and Introduction, which uh, had a second edition come out in 2018. And of course, uh, contributor to the recent feminism and international relations book which uh, has been making quite a few waves in the field. So I'm going to hand over to Paul who's going to talk for about 10 minutes and then Elizabeth and Kimberly will each spend 10 or 15 minutes each commenting on the book. And Paul, uh, Paul's book is called Conflict, War and Revolution and its theme is really about the recurring importance of violence and power politics and aggression really in international relations. Uh, it's a theme that a lot of us, I thought, certainly myself, <laughs> hoped would go away 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, that was a sort of golden age of utopianism in international political thought. Uh, and Paul has really um, revived uh, and resuscitated a whole strand of debate starting with Thucydides and then running forward through uh, a, a galaxy of other thinkers including Saint Augustine, Machiavelli, Locke, Thomas Hobbes, Rousseau, 
uh, um, uh, Lenin, Mark, Ben Mao, and the most recently Carl Schmidt. So it's a very interesting and completely different perspective really on international relations uh, thinking. But it's one that um, sadly is incredibly relevant for our, our times that we're now living in. We're, we're living in a situation right at this moment where the, the Russian Federation has 100,000 troops poised to do something, nobody quite knows what, exercises or invasion, you know, pick your answer, on the borders of Ukraine. Um, meanwhile, uh, China keeps uh, saying that they will be at some stage reoccupying or reunifying Taiwan with the, uh, with the motherland. So these are very, very big conflicts that uh, really go to the heart of the international system as it used to be even 10 years ago. Um, and so I, I, it, it's just wonderful to see from Paul a book that brings the whole centuries of experience to bear. I'm going to give him a measly 10 minutes just to kick off and uh, take us through some of the themes. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you especially to uh, both Liz and to Kim for uh, being here to comment on this book tonight. So let me introduce the book. It's Conflict, War and Revolution. It's a book of political theory. I think it's important to say that um, first and foremost, um, it covers very important issues that are, are also dealt with expertly by different colleagues at LSE who know far more about, say, the comparative politics of revolution or, or um, you know, conflict studies. This is a political theory book. It comprises studies of nine individual thinkers. They're all men. Um, maybe that's something we will come back to from the Greek world to the present. And there's a concluding essay which draws together some themes. Each chapter is freestanding and it offers an overview of the main political ideas of the thinkers concerned. So it's not a history in a straightforward sense. Okay, there's no single underlying theory or um, argument that these thinkers contribute to. There's no doctrine that I'm telling the story of. I think it's important to say that first and foremost. It would be easy but wrong to see this as a sort of alternative history of realism in IR, which is a different thing, connected, but it is a different thing. Um, and instead, I want to give an alternative story about why I've brought these thinkers together. They're all important. They all say something about the key issues that Patrick mentioned in his introduction. But what is, what is bringing this together? So let me start at the end. Perhaps that's the best place to start. Um, the last substantive chapter is on Carl Schmidt. And um, my concluding overview covers um, the emergence of what we might call a realist turn in political theory. And the two are linked, um, but they're linked in a complex way. So why start with Schmidt? Why, why, why end the book? Why am I starting now with Schmidt as part of the unifying story? Schmidt was, as many will know, um, a, a German jurist whose reputation was massively tainted by his association with the Nazis. But he's also become an iconic figure on both the political left and the political right. And the reason for this has largely to do with the way in which Schmidt is a provocation to um, much professional political theory. Because of his rejection of the instrumentation of politics, and his assertion of the primacy of conflict and confrontation. And in this, he stands, as I say, as a constant provocation to what I was confronting as the sort of dominant or an overly dominant voice in political theory, which is a sort of rational cosmopolitanism. 
a view that saw the challenges of political theory as you know making clear and and supporting the relationships between individuals and groups and so on on fair terms of cooperation in an increasingly globalized world assuming perhaps that history was marching towards globalization so the challenge is to that cosmopolitanism and the resurgence of a sort of realist approach to thinking about politics and theorizing it in a normative way. So what do I want to say about this realist political theory? Okay, realism comes in many forms. Um, international relations scholars will be very familiar with realism as the sort of you know disciplinary norm that pretty much everybody rejects but it means something very specific in neo-realism in international relations theory but political theorists have turned to realism and again what i want to do is to draw out what's significant about that as the sort of unifying story of the book some of these realist perspectives reject the idea of morality altogether they argue for a chastened politics based on interest and the conflict of interests power politics and so on yet that doesn't have to be the only realist story part of the argument that many political theory realists make is that realists do accept the idea of a norm governed conception of the political but they see those norms as internal to the practice of politics. Whatever, whatever that thing politics is, the norms come from the way in which it's done rather than serve as sort of external impositions and checks on how it should be done. So the site of politics is consequently not irrelevant. And one of the things I wanted to do with these different thinkers is draw on political theorists who for um, various sorts of reasons, um, contextual, but also theoretical, see the site of politics, the place where political, fundamental political activity takes place as being something that is ambiguous and controversial and is an important part of how we think about politics. So the site of politics is not irrelevant. In contrast to cosmopolitanism, which basically reduces um, all political questions to the relationships between individuals conceived in different ways, but always in terms of some ethical category, right? So the cosmopolitans think that ultimately we need to think about politics in terms of an ethical approach which prioritizes the claims of individuals and where it differs is how those individuals are conceived and recognized and what goes with that claim. So I wanted to partly react to that. I mean, partly biographically, it's coming back to that world after being in a, in a management role for, for 10 years, but it's also, um, it's also a recognition of the increasing you know, political challenge, the real world political challenge to what looks like an ever more utopian vision of politics. So that's why I wanted to turn to some resources, some thinkers who give us um, ideas or contribute to visions of politics, which um, are characterized by the absence of this cosmopolitan appeal, the idea of a, of a sort of ethical framework which frames politics. Now that, to bring this to a conclusion, is where a number of other ideas come up, some which we may talk about more, the place of violence in how we think about fundamental political relations. Um, a person who is not um, addressed in a discrete chapter, but who is very present uh, throughout the book is Hannah Arendt, okay? I mean, in a way, much of the space of interesting political theory is somewhere between um, Schmidt and Arendt, and that was part of the inspiration. Arendt argues directly in a famous essay on violence 
um, and assumes this pretty much constantly through her political writings, that violence is a fundamentally anti-political idea or experience. Okay, it's where power really runs out and politics itself comes to an end. Recourse to it is the denial of politics. Now, alternatively, um, many political theories sort of recognize that but see it as prevalent and therefore see the task of politics as the containment or the management of violence. But I also wanted to include some who deny that sort of Arendtian position, who don't see politics as antithetical to the perspective of politics and equally don't just see it as one of the tools that can be exercised in politics, but in some sense they see violence exercised in certain ways as actually definitive. Now, the obvious way of seeing that is through theorizing war, but it's not just war in this case. Violence is all over the place in different ways. So how we think about war as a response to the exception emergency and so on, the sort of backdrop that breaks through the thin veneer of civilization and so on, all of that is part of the story, but also the way in which we think of war, and that's partly why Clausewitz is in the story, okay, as an activity that isn't, in a sense, independent of the way we think about politics. And then finally, there is history. The challenge that um, the cosmopolitans present, some directly, is this view popularized by Obama and lots of other people, you know, that the arc of history is long, but it tends towards justice. History has no narrative, no sort of logic that redeems us. And it was precisely that that I wanted to address by bringing in um, the ideas of St. Augustine, who argues that in a very specific context, but also ha gives us a sort of, you know, uh, uh, leaves us a legacy for thinking about the way in which redemption and politics, as the, uh, history as the place where politics happens, as being two very different things that should not be confused. So each of the thinkers covered... Um, contribute to this idea of a realist theory. And what they do is provide resources for thinking about political theory as a conception of political prudence, right? One which is distinct from the sort of Ciceronian cosmopolitan idea that the right or justice and prudence converge and justice always wins. And whilst I've contributed to that kind of paradigm of political theory, it's one that I'm not um, rejecting, but also one that I'm particularly concerned, needs to think hard about its basis, its foundation, its relevance in the context of people who just have a very different view about how the world works. So not assuming that everybody will come round to my side of the argument and see that uh, the arc of history is tending towards what I think is the best way of organizing a political society. So that was really the, uh, the rationale and the, the overall narrative linking these thinkers. Uh, sorry, that's great, Paul. Thank you very much. You didn't mention the state at any point in your 10-minute ten, ten introduction. Is, is the state uh, a, a, an inherently important part of the concept, given that some people define the state as the you know, monopoly of legit legitimate violence? Um, so, and also violence between states is, is the, the common form of war now. Yes, I mean, it, the state is a clear, clearly an important part of the narrative of some of the chapters, okay? The state and the centrality of the state obviously breaks down when we get into the, into the modern world, the 20th century, certainly the early 20th century, when we're thinking about the revolutionary thinkers who see the state in a sense as something to be moved out of the way and see its, its sort of um, claim to monopolize violence as part of its problem um, and 
it requires violence to dispense with that. And then with Schmidt, you have this sort of ambiguous view about the central elements of statehood, sovereign power, um, you know, the sort of uh, claim to um, have uh, overall authority of the domain of the political. All of those things become problematized. And where do those ideas reside? So the state is very much part of the story. But if you think of the middle part of the book, you know, if we look at sort of Hobbes, classic state theorist, you know, Hobbes's state of nature is almost the sort of model that, you know, neo-realists take to explain international relations. Um, you think of Locke, you think of Rousseau, the state is there, but it's there in very different ways. And similarly, I thought of um, Clausewitz being an important contributor to that because of the way in which he deals with the state from the perspective of someone who exercises, but also theorizes, you know, this fundamental idea of organized violence and the, and the military power of the state. What is it he's doing? How, does, how is that conceived? And how does it relate to a particular model of the state, um, which has come to be uh, problematic and um, also um, central to uh, certainly 20th century politics, um, and which we thought we were getting over in this world of cosmopolitanism. We don't need all that anymore. So it is there very much. Great. That's wonderful, Paul. Well, uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Fraser from New College Oxford. And um, Elizabeth, if you unmute, then we'll be able to hear you. I don't know if you can do that. That's it. So over to you, Elizabeth, for Thank your you. commentary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for um, inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to read the book. Um, and thanks very much for that illuminating presentation just now, which I have to say did address some of the issues that I'm going to raise. So I, I don't think actually what you said rendered what I'm going to raise otios i hope not but I, well if it, if they were to we're going to cut this thing short so we need to have a conversation so i'm going to i'm going to continue to say what i'd um, what i thought i was going to say um yeah, i mean you've just be, been at pains to tell us the way in which the chapters both are discreet and to be read separately and also <clears throat> are linked by an overarching theme and some kind of story, although you really don't want it to be a very, very, very tight story. I think that is a technical problem with publishing these days, right? That, that um, readers expect to be able to download. I do it myself, goodness sake. You know, you download a single, a single chapter and you don't want to be trammeled by having to read a hundred thousand words or or more, but it did. I, I do think that um, it, it is a technical and it's a difficult problem for authors to tackle. Um, and I, I it, you know, I, so what I'm going to say might come across as kind of unfair, especially what I've just said about my own downloading of single chapters from people's people's books, which nowadays we are able to do. So I, I don't want to be unfair. But on the other hand, I do think that the kind of the thread, the arc, that there might not be an arc to history, but there does on the whole need to be an arc to a monograph. And I was in several minds about what the arc of the plot of this monograph really, really, really is. So the, the subtitle of the book is The Problem of Politics in International Political Thought. And having got to the end of it, I sat back and I thought, OK, so what is the problem of politics of course you mustn't be too literalist when people say the problem they usually mean various problems or they don't have to mean there's one problem of politics but that politics is a problem for international political thought and i have to say i don't think i'm really clear about exactly what is why politics is um, a problem. 
any more than, say, law might be a problem, or as is part of your own story, why moral claims might be a problem for political, for international thought. And so also, of course, my, our economic flows or the, the facts of, of economy and wealth and exploitation. So in what way is it that, in, in what way does the book address politics exactly as a problem for political thought? Well, in your, your remarks just now, you sort of, you address that, that um, there are different um, ways of understanding politics, which we find in different thinkers, and you are focusing on two particular constructions of politics, one of which um, sees the possibility of government and order and legitimacy on an, as it were, cosmo cosmopolitan scale and as including the achievement of morality, of morality or ethics. And another account of politics, which sees it as tied to particular conflicts, particular peoples, particular places, and the way in which those two ways of thinking about politics one as the aspiration to a kind of frictionless govern, governing process, and the other as a conflict-ridden, particularistic, struggle-type process, the way in which those two ways of thinking about politics then cash out when we think about the relationships between states or when we think about the relationships across nations, across, across polities. <laughs> I'm not really sure that um, I, I think that that is an interesting and very suggestive um, way of sort of structuring an argument. But then I felt that with some of the chapters and some of the sections within the chapters, I was losing the plot about the way in which politics is or is not a problem for this thinker. Um, and I would it would have been nice, and, you know, or it would be nice, actually, to hear you say a bit more about how that how that actually actually works. Then. So you've got that kind of dualism going, I think. And then there's this other dualism, uh, which is the realism versus the idealism. Um, distinction of, of which you make quite a bit of in the introduction and then try to come back to and and kind of deal with in a more synoptic way in the conclusion and as you've just said in your remarks there's also another kind of duality or another tension let's say um, between vi uh, violence and a full-throated yes politics is a it's all a nasty business and let's face up to that um, and a and an aspiration to pacification, the hope that the point of politics is that it displaces violence and things that used to be done by the sword can now, now be done by the word. Um, and you're, you're sort of problematizing both of those. I think what, what um, again, a question that I had when I came to the end of the book was whether I was supposed to be reading those as frames for understanding history for understanding what went on in the Chinese revolution or what's happening in new forms of war or what happened in the uh, English civil war. Um, whether I ought to be uh, treating those as a frame for understanding events and relationships and structures. So ha this is, uh, this is how we ought to understand US hegemony in the uh, late 20th century, for example, or whether I, was, I should have been using those as a frame for understanding texts and theories and thinkers. And I, my sense at the end was that, the, and this is again because of having chapters that are called things like Locke <laughs> or Thucydides, um, 
is is it that that is the focus or is it events and history and relationships and structures and um i mean probably the answer quite quite uh, reasonably is that you're kind of doing both and you can't do either of them perfectly but i'd be really interested to know uh, really what way you would how you think that um you you coped with that tension and um the degree to which that those are tensions that really are as as i thought of them um to be central central to the book i didn't look to see what time it was when i started but i think i'll leave my remarks there but thanks paul for a for a full a full a, a full couple of days reading for me Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Very, very interesting and, and stimulating comments. Um, we're going to move on straight away to Kimberley, so that you've got to hold these uh, points in your head, if you, if you will, Paul, um, so that uh, we can move on to Kimberley, who's Professor of International Relations at Queen Mary University, London. So. Thanks, Patrick, and thanks, uh, Paul. Um, uh, as uh, Liz said, you've given us a, a good dose of reading to get through, um, which has been rather fun. Um, I do enjoy revisiting, particularly thinkers like Augustine, who I have not uh, um, focused my attention on for quite a long time. So I'm going to say a few general things, and it will pick up, I think, on some of the comments that Paul has made and that Liz has made in response to, to Paul. Um, and again, maybe push Paul a little bit on some of the things that um, uh, some of the themes that I'm quite intrigued to hear more from him in his voice on, because the book is really interesting because in a sense it's it's a quite a complex mediation between Paul's concerns and trying to do justice to the concerns of the thinkers that he's looking at. The thinkers are spread across a very long period of time. We've got two and a half thousand years of, of thinking there. We've got very complex texts and arguments being engaged with. So it's a, it's a real, really big project. Uh, it's dealing with a great deal of, of material and argument. In some ways, I, I, I mean, I'm, I, I, I like it very much that it's quite an old fashioned approach it's drawing on classical thinkers and texts to interrogate big picture themes and ideas and issues. And that is always stimulating um, and interesting for me. I mean, in the introduction, various themes and issues are picked out, and we've heard about some of these already. Uh, one is the nature of politics itself and how we're to understand it, and that's come up in, in both Paul's and Liz's comments, so I won't say more about that, but I think there's an interesting uh, question. At the beginning, there's a reference to politics as an autonomous way of acting. In your comments just now, Paul, you were talking about politics as a site, and I, I would just be really interested in, in hearing a bit more about how you're understanding um, uh, politics um as it were in your own voice as opposed to the perhaps somewhat different ways that the thinkers you're engaging with would be would be thinking about it uh, the second big theme is obviously the relationship between violence and politics um and i won't say any more on that because it's already been uh, raised or i won't say much more about that one that we haven't really talked about is the role of temporality in politics which is something that i i've had an interest in, it in for some time um, one of the ways that sometimes people draw the contrast between the kind of cosmopolitanism that Paul is critiquing here and the more, in inverted commas, realist tradition is in terms of a difference between a more kind of linear temporality of progress and a more cyclical temporality in which, you know, there's rise, rise and fall of power and so on. Um, I think one of the interesting things about these thinkers is that obviously they have quite different, I think, temporalities um, at work in them. So again, it raises for me the question about where you would want to kind of place yourself in, re in relationship to that question about politics and temporality, uh, Paul, because I think you've got, you've got the dual temporalities of Augustine. You've got, I think, 
it's arguably anyway um, a Christian temporality at work in in Locke. Um, you've got obviously the cyclical story that you get in Machiavelli. So I'm kind of intrigued as to as to where you would place yourself in those stories about temporality and and politics. Um, and the other big theme, which I think you spoke to already very eloquently, Paul, is, is the meaning and significance of history. That also speaks to Liz's comments. But I, I thought it was very helpful what you said about, you know, what you're trying to make an argument is in part that, there, you know, there is no single narrative uh, trying to get away. And that, again, is part of this critique of, of cosmopolitanism. So we've got a book that's reflecting on these big themes through engagement with classical thinkers. In doing that, it's also raising questions about political theory canons, about the idea of paradigms for political thought, questions of interpretation of the relationship between positivity and normativity in political thinking, and also questions about pedagogy, which I would like to, to um, come back to. And fundamentally, that this, this question that you really come to at the end the idea of a realist turn in political theory and quite what that might uh, mean. So I suppose what I want to say about all of those themes and big questions is, I'd like to know more about where you stand, uh, uh, Paul. But I wanna move on now um, to a slightly different set of uh, focuses. Um, one of the things that I think you're doing in the book is to uh, challenge an, an old distinction between political theory on the one hand and international political thought or international relations theory uh, on the other. Um, I think there's, there's maybe sort of, um, I, I suppose there's two questions I want to ask about that really. Uh, one is in challenging that, are you challenging it essentially on the basis that it rests on this problematic distinction between a realm of justice and, and on the other, a, a realm of, of uh, conflict? So going back to, to, to Liz's point, or are you also challenging it not just in terms of trying to think about politics differently from the kind of classical cosmopolitan sort of view, but also to think about ethics differently. And I do wonder whether this is part of the story, particularly when we come to the stuff about the realist political turn at the end. So what may connect some of the elements of classical realism and in an IR sense, not neo-realism, but classical realism, and the realist turn in political theory may actually be different ways of thinking about ethics, non-Kantian ways of thinking about ethics, a more contextualist approach to ethics. Um, and I, I think in that respect, again, that the challenge to the distinction between political theory and international theory or international relations theory kind of um, carries with it a lot of really interesting philosophical baggage, if you like, a lot of really interesting questions that we could open up further. And I'd certainly be very sympathetic to the idea that actually one of the things we need to do is not only think about politics differently from that cosmopolitan story, but also uh, ethics uh, differently. On that realist question, in your conclusion, you pick up on these two different kinds of meanings of realism, the classical IR sense of a state based positivist, privileging power, um, status quo oriented mode of thinking. And then you have this notion of realism in a more pragmatic sense, maybe uh, linking a bit with the work of people like Matt Sleet and so on. And I'm kind of interested in how you may be or may not be bringing those two things together. So again, something that it would be good um, to hear a bit more of. Um, the last thing I want to say something about is is, is the broader kind of second order questions perhaps that the book raises. Um, questions about canons, questions about paradigms, uh, interpretation and uh, pedagogy. Now, I think you, you do um, try to preempt uh, getting into one of those endless academic arguments about what's the appropriate method in the history of political thought or whatever. And I, I do appreciate that you don't want to get bogged down in those kinds of questions. 
But so I'm going to focus my comments really on the pedagogy issue, because I think canons are primarily about pedagogy. And you acknowledge in your, you know, introduction that, you know, of course, canons can be made up in different ways, that there's always, you know, different elements involved, that there's always ways in which you can contest a particular canon that's been uh, put together. Um, and you also very explicitly try to preempt, I think, feminist critique of yet another male canon uh, within the within the book, you know, Thucydides uh, through to Schmidt. And now one of the um, pieces of work that I'm currently engaged in, as you know, and which is actually referenced by Paul in the book, uh, is a project examining the work of women in the history of international thought. And I suppose there's two things I want to say about what I find slightly troubling in your preemption of the feminist critique, uh, Paul. The first thing is that you do conflate feminists with women, effectively denying women thinkers have done first order work, even though in your own introductory comments and elsewhere in the text, People like Luxembourg and Arendt both do get a mention as first order thinkers uh, in international political thought. So there's something a bit odd, I think, about that move. Um, but maybe for me, the slightly more important thing is that this is a book for teaching. And I think the construction of knowledge it's not just about a particular content, a particular set of paradigmatic positions within international political thought, which you can use these thinkers to convey to students different ways of thinking about uh, politics in the international context. The production of knowledge is always also a relational process in which teachers and the material they're teaching connect with a particular audience. So to go to an example from my own teaching practice, if you explain the significance of recognitive relationships, relationships of recognition for human freedom to a diverse audience of students using Hegel, you construct knowledge in a different way than if you try to do the same thing in using Beauvoir or Du Bois. So I think there's something more going on in the construction of knowledge and the use of canons that perhaps you are slightly evading in the way in which you preempt or attempt to preempt the feminist critique uh, at the beginning. Because I think meaning is, at the end of the day, constructed through relationships in teaching. And the texts that you use and the thinkers that you use can matter for who they are, as well as for what they say. Um, so I would like to take issue, I think, <laughs> with the way in which uh, you, you attempt, as it were, get around that criticism. Having said that, these are incredibly rich thinkers. They have a lot to offer for us. So there's no way that I would deny that. And clearly, the way that the book may be used as well in being able to download separate chapters and so on opens up the possibility for putting those thinkers into different kinds of dialogue with other thinkers as well. So I'm not suggesting that the, as a pedagogic tool, it can't be used uh, in many different ways. But I think I'll leave my uh, comments there. And uh, thank you for the opportunity of reading uh, the book. Thanks very much indeed, Kimberly. Well, thank you for all, uh, uh, all of those contributions. Now, I know that um, uh, Paul will have lots of things that he needs to say to uh, a response to Elizabeth and Kimberly, but let me just, before he, he, he does that, say thank you to all the people who've already uh, put in some really wonderful questions, which I we're going to get onto um, in just a, a, a minute. But, so I will try and ask Paul to keep his responses to a minimum, because I think many of the themes that Elizabeth and Kimberly have raised are also coming up in some of the questions. And uh, so it would be really good to get the audience's uh, involvement. And if you're out in the audience and you'd like to ask a question, please just uh, bang in whatever you like. It can be a short one or a long one. Uh, and it can be about anything that sort of relates to the discussion we're having here. And please don't feel inhibited about asking your question, even though we're 
in the company of some illustrious political theorists. They're all very friendly, friendly people. So, Paul, give us your quick um, Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Kim, and thank you, Liz, for, for, for the provocation. Um, uh, the, all, all the questions, all, all the points you raise, and they're complex and interconnected, are... I won't, I won't say they're all things I'm, I'm, I'm aware of, because that looks kind of silly, but, but I'm mindful of. So let, let me perhaps start with, with Kim's point about pedagogy. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, it's pretty obvious that my attempt to justify the selection and certainly the character of that selection in terms of the gender of the authors is, you know, is a holding position, right? Um, is it something that I would want to go to the stake over? Um, I'm not going to, 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 to say. But I, 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 I thought these thinkers had something distinctive to say, and in many cases, I did think of who alternatives would, would be who dressed the same kinds of issues. And of course, given what you've both said, that there's a very broad range of things going on here, both in terms of the arguments about or oh, arguments within particular texts, as well as, and, and in the interpretation of particular thinkers, as well as whatever the narrative arc of the book is, um, I sort of had to, to st stay where I am um, and make those connections tentative. Um, the only thing I'd say in, in sort of self-defense is that although you're absolutely right, Kim, to say that you know who you pick to address or be the exemplar of a particular position and so on does elicit a different response from different audiences. Um, some of this has been field trialed in terms of, you know, I mean, the book emerged out of a course that I taught for quite a long time. It to a very mixed and very international audience. And some of the sort of uh, selection was precisely driven by those sort of pedagogic responses. Okay. Now, sometimes the obvious response with some of the thinkers chosen is going to be the challenge. All right. Um, you know, and, and often it's things that people don't see in terms of what's being included and what's not. I mean, I, I, I always like to, you know, to present my, uh, my sort of Augustine stuff um, in a way that um, sees him represented in, you know, the iconography of the medieval church as a sort of statuesque, you know, essentially white male. And he's an African. He's an African who actually saw himself as an African. You know, he writes about you know, an African writing for other Africans in Africa. Now, of course, that raises another issue about, you know, what's the site of politics and so on, because, of course, he's also part, very much part of the Roman Empire. But a significant part of the Roman Empire at that time was the North African uh, Empire, which was different and saw itself as being different. So, so there are some sort of bits of inclusion here which are to provoke, but are also kind of a response to precisely those sort of challenges that you rightly raise are important in terms of thinking who's in and who's out. Um, if, if, you, if you read the preface, you'll also know that this was part of a 27 chapter book. And, you know, if, had, I, had I waited till the whole thing is done or continued it and you know whatever uh, you'd have had a thousand pages you would have had a, a sort of different canon partly you'd have had the 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 other side of the story that um you know I've just sort of explained in terms of the anti-cosmopolitan view but you'd also have at the very end of that story people who are much more explicit about um, 
you know, the realism, cosmopolitanism, um, you know, dichotomy as being in the end, something that needs to be transcended with a kind of political prudence. And, and that I think does resonate again with this idea of, of you know, the, the new realist political theory discourse as being about precisely that where the need to abandon the ethical, the need to abandon the ethical is precisely that idea of the sort of legacy of, well, if you think of the way Charles Mills describes, you know, liberal politics, it's lock and cat. It's that idea of, you know, freestanding individuals um, in some sense, realistic or, 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 or um, philosophical, relating to each other in a way that then constitutes political and state power. And that is ultimately a juridical ethical creation. So there is a, 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 an issue there about um, morality, what we mean by it, um, what, what its place will be in thinking about politics, given that what I'm not doing is just providing sort of conceptual clarifications and a history of, um, if you like, political speech. It's to the service of doing political theory, challenging and opening up, and partly also exploring what those alternative visions really are and how they're, they're presented to us. Um, so that's an important part of the story. And it links to this question about, you know, what is the political and the site of the political where Liz started, um, which is a very important point. Where, where do I say that? And how do I link this, the, the, the individual chapters clearly enough to show that there is, there is actually, a, a, you know, a, if, not a, if not a conversation, at, at least they're all, you know, clearly doing the thing I say they're doing. Um, the site of the political, I think, is was important to me because, I mean, if we start at the end with Schmidt, it's very, it's very common for students as well as for you know academic colleagues to throw out this idea of the, you know, they the, the easy talk about what the domain of the political is, okay, as if that's sort of self-explanatory. And then, you know, to fall back on well, you know, the domain of the political is the sort of friend-enemy confrontation, okay? And, you know, I'm in print elsewhere, and this was picked up by my uh, sort of late great colleague and friend, Glenn Newey, with criticizing Schmidt for, for kind of arbitrarily identifying that. Um, I don't think it's as arbitrary as he suggests, but it also raises questions which are not not well um, defended in his own work about how different bits fit together. So the domain of the political and this sort of existential confrontation and the character of that and how that's supposed to link to institutions, particularly juridical institutions, right? Because, you know, Schmidt is ultimately uh, a, um, a lawyer, right? Um, and he approaches the study of politics through this, the, the, well, what he sees as the sort of unstated politics in juridical arguments and, and legal discourse, okay? So he's constantly drawing our attention to something that's behind that in the state of the exception and the power of the sovereign to decide and so on. And there's this other thing. So what is that other thing? Where does it reside? And so on. And of course, a lot of the thinkers that are dealt with earlier are part of the sources of his answer to that, right? So some of this is foregrounding the familiar um, in this sort of iconic, um, controversial late thinker. So it's not a book about the sources of Schmidt, but it is drawing out those ideas. So you know, Augustine on history, redemption, um, and temporality, um, Machiavelli too, um, on the place of violence, um, Clausewitz, 
um, is you know really one of the most important sources there. And Clausewitz, you know, I think is 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 important. He's important because he addresses in he he addresses almost by not addressing, but he does sort of kind of directly address those who want to see you know, history with a purpose and direction, the place of war as being some sort of condition and tool for moving on to some, it's this abandonment of teleology, the end of history, and it's the abandonment of the idea that, um, you know, history is anything other than the succession of events, the sort of secular history that Augustine leads us with where there is this linear one, almost one damn thing after another model without anything at the end of it. It's, it doesn't have uh, a narrative and it doesn't even have a, a, a direction. There's, there isn't progress um, or there isn't progress in the sense of progress towards something else. There's progress in the way that kind of Hayek and, and Oakshot thought of as just being change. And it's change that is the problem, rather than change being a problem that brings with it, has inherent in it, its own solution. So you want to know where I kind of come down on this? I'm probably on that sort of pessimistic Augustinianism. But I don't think that means that political theory collapses and you can't make normative claims and so on. It makes it harder and it makes it harder to sustain ideas that, you know, the, that, that violence is just categorically out of consideration, but it, it's the terrain on which effective political arguments need to be made. Thanks very much, Paul. That's great. Um, I feel we should uh, move to the questions now because we've got a, a galaxy of very interesting questions and um, I'm going to put them to uh, all three of you. So if anybody wants to chip in, uh, um, these are all actually really good questions that I don't know what the answer to is. But the first one, of course, is as soon as you write a book about uh, 10 or 11 people, somebody says, why didn't you talk about, yeah. sort of turn, turn, so. yeah. but uh, Vijay Shrao says, isn't your choice rather uh, Eurocentric, uh, and why didn't you include Sun Tzu or Ibn Khaldun, Chinese Islamic political thought, uh, Chanakya, maybe? Um, yeah. Uh, now you, you've mentioned that uh, Saint Augustine is is an African uh, uh, theorist, and that Mao, of course, is a Chinese yeah. theorist, but. Um, would, would, would the analysis, would the debates be very different if we went to other, other cultures and so on? And uh, I'm thinking here particularly of, uh, I remember reading uh, Randall Collins' massive book on the sociology of philosophy, it's where he you know, yeah. beavers off and, and, and tells you huge new yeah. stories about Chinese metaphysics and, and so on, which I had not one clue. Uh, but uh, presumably the, 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 the themes and the, some of the tensions and some of the alternatives will be relatively similar. What, what do you think, uh, anybody, Paul? Can I, can I just, so let, let me just take that head on. I think there's a simple answer, which won't be the satisfactory answer, but it is an answer which I think is important when you try and look at this idea of expanding or decolonizing or globalizing the curriculum. And I'm going to say this, you know, because I kind of know this from, you know, I have a son who's a professor of Chinese literature. If you're going to introduce um, profound and important thinkers from another culture, you kind of have to be able to read the material. It's, it's too easy. And I think I know why we do it, but it's too easy for us and particularly, you know, middle aged white men like me to think that I can, you know, expand the story by bringing in some um, selective Chinese or Persian or South Asian texts or Arabic texts. I don't speak Arabic. I really don't speak Mandarin and and so on. So then you're relying on other authorities to tell you these are the right things. And it's kind of interesting that if you think of the history of 
the profession of political theory. You know, there's one reason why, um, you know, the discussion of ancient Greek political thought by political theorists is one thing, and classicists do something different. It's because the classicists are not bothered what you know people who don't really understand the entire Greek canon think about Thucydides or Plato in the way that you know philosophers who've been trained in PPE and know enough about the, the key translations to say something philosophical do. So there's caution there and a certain sense of humility in the face of that challenge. At a secondary level, um, I wouldn't want to talk about this at any great length today, but I do think you know, that the questioner does bring up some important thinkers that could indeed be in this story. But I just think that me doing that, and in the end, all books are written by an author, and the author has to take responsibility for that. Me doing that would have been, um, well, I think unsatisfactory, actually. You do mention in relation to Mao that the, the interrelationship between his thinking and his mm. borrowings from Eurocentric thought and his uh, mm. familiarity with and grounding in Chinese political, uh, yeah. traditional political thought. Well, yes, I do. I do. But I'm very careful what I use. So Mao, Mao is also interesting in that he is an international revolutionary. Hmm. So although, you know, there's another world in which, you know, what Mao did, thought, wrote, and the relevant texts takes you in a direction that's very domestic. And his poetry, which I know by um, other people telling me uh, is great. I steer away from that. And the, the bits that I've focused on are the bits where he's engaging with the transformation of Leninism. So he's really, he's looking at a Western problem, canon, theory from his own national perspective. And I'm looking at that. And the same when he's thinking about war. Okay, obviously, there's the practice of war in the in the war against the uh, Kuomintang, and there's also the, the role in the opposition to the Japanese. But he's also thinking about this in the context of Clausewitz. Clausewitz would have been known pretty much by all sort of you know, well-prepared Marxist-Leninists because Engels and Lenin thought Clausewitz was an important read. So in a way, I have a get-out-of-jail-free card there because they're doing the Western thing. If he was writing, and he does in some places in a way that separates us out, then he removes, he's removed from that, uh, that debate. But maybe the others want to say something. Oh, question. Elizabeth? Yeah, I don't think I've got a huge amount to add to that. Um, I think that one, I, I mean, I in, sorry, I just want to endorse Paul's caution about our um, compromising scholarly standards hmm. in order to try, yeah. you know, in order to try to expand the references what we actually need though and I do think that perhaps there is a downside to the sort of named individuals as chapter headings format here notwithstanding all the reasons why one does want to do that for readability but no. what we do is to get to grips with um questions and problems and be open to people from different backgrounds or with different citations and references saying oh well no that's not really a problem if you look at it from this point of view or yes no well that was also a problem for this group of thinkers or was a problem yeah. in that time and I, I, so I think it's that sort of openness to dialogue that is the most important thing going forward um, as we try to widen the yeah. reference and and decolonize de-imperialize the curriculum which i'm very keen on yeah i mean but just just one additional point to make i mean the western focus did rather impose itself on many many other um, parts of the world in which it, such that they have a kind of ownership as well of some of these debates and i think that's you know i mean i've 
talked about this stuff in China and in Japan and so on. Um, and they're interested in that, not, not just to sort of flatter me, but because, of course, they are actually interested in, in the way in which the Western canon has been used and in some cases directly used to sort of theorize the kind of states they ought to adopt in the early, you know, in the mid late 19th century, early 20th century. You know, the Japanese actually went out to look around Europe and the United States to find the constitutional theory mm -hmm. that they would take home and attach to their process of modernization. They didn't take the British Parliament, they didn't take the United States Constitution, they took, you know, the German Russian constitution. The, yeah, the Russian, Russian public administration. I remember going through the library in uh, yeah. Kyoto and uh, yeah. on one visit, and they had a magnificent yeah. selection of French and yeah. German. Yeah. Interesting. And there's Kimberly, a bit of that in China too. You know. Yeah, Kimberly, did you hey. have any thoughts on that? Aspect? No, I don't think I have anything else to add on that theme. Thank you. Um, there was also a, a question about the. Uh, uh, the, the issue of men and women in international relations. And uh, so mm -hmm. Lydia Ebden says, men have had a few thousand years of deciding about everything on war. <laughs> and I'm just one woman and I'm hardly sick of it, the highly uncomplimentary light it shines on men. Isn't it time for men to step aside and give women a go at settling things peacefully? If they did, would it make any difference? Um, what do you think? Is there a... I mean uh, uh, maybe the other should element ask element in the in the yeah. in the uh, yeah. the uh, obsession with violence and, and so forth. Um, I think Kim should have a go at that one. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a it's a, an interesting question to raise. There's obviously a point of view, a quite well established point of view, in which women are associated with more pacific qualities, but there's also a lot of arguments yeah. that that's a somewhat problematic position to take yeah um women have and do support war and violence uh, etc so i think it's certainly the case that you can build on strands of feminist ethics and politics for peacemaking purposes and also base pacifist arguments on those uh, traditions but i don't think it's as straightforward as if you give the women a go, things will be settled uh, peacefully. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's more complex uh, than that. Yeah, I, I okay. quite agree. I think I think you know there's 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 a lot of interesting sort of material that isn't quite covered here, but we've mentioned Arendt and you know. And Kim is quite right. I mentioned you know Rosa Luxemburg in the in you know the by the way in the discussion obviously women not obvious that they are you know kind of if you think of this sort of anti-war and soft you know they have very very clear views about the relationship between you know violence and politics and so on but i think Arendt would well yeah i mean Arendt is Arendt. she would just say that's i'm sorry that's just that's just the way it is not that's not me speaking as a woman here or writing as a woman or experiencing power as a woman either yeah, I think I think the fact that uh, male violence has dominated overall and over long periods of time uh, doesn't actually mean that there aren't, as it were, other violent actors and, um, yeah. you know, sort of removing male violence from the scene would undoubtedly give everybody a bit of a breathing space and would be very welcome but you can't extrapolate from that into yeah. an open pacifist future. Yeah, and how, how do you do that anyway? I mean, that's also the fundamental challenge. Okay, well, I'm looking now at the, the questions that have been most uprated by the audience, and mm -hmm. I've, I've got one from Anastasia Steblet sova um, and she's asking particularly about the political theory of Thomas Hobbes and the... Uh, although he's an absolutist, he stresses the interrelationship between the, 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 the sovereign and the meeting the needs of, or at least serving the needs of the, of the populace, and, um, uh, and uh, points out that Hobbes argues without uh, paying sufficient attention to that, he, you know, you're not going to survive long as a sovereign. Uh, 
So she wants to know, um, should, we, should we always think of the sovereign as self-limiting in that, in that way? Um, Paul? Well, I mean, obviously, there's, the yeah, there's, there's, two, the there's two things. Threat. Yeah, there's, there's two things going on here, which um, you know, I cover perhaps didn't bring out fully. I mean, Hobbes' account of sovereignty is an account of the nature of sovereignty and what sort of thing is it. It's a juridical construction that's made up of rights consolidated that then gives you something different. So sovereignty is unlimited. It has no, um, you know, there's no formal constraints on what it can require and so on. But Hobbes also has running alongside that a different story about political prudence. And he keeps those things conceptually distinct. I think that's that's an important point. And of course, political prudence is, you know, even if you have all the powers in the world, how you use them still requires a bit of thought because what are you trying to do and what are the consequences of exercising your power in certain ways? But by keeping those two things different, uh, distinct, he wants to ensure that the, the scope and limit of this power, this thing called the state, doesn't get confused with the instrumental dimension of prudential thinking so that you could say, well, you know, this case is, is gone beyond the pale. This is, you know, sovereigns can destroy sovereign states, but there's no issue of right or, or irrationality about that. Um, and that's, I think, the important point. Um, and then on the other hand, you've got other thinkers who think that there's only prudence rather than right. And then the question is, who's prudence? An individual, possibly Machiavelli and the Prince, a group, certainly that's Rousseau's view, both in, Ho in Locke, internally, the state, externally, you know, the residual right to exercise the uh, executive power of the law of nature, to be violent to people, punish them, and so on. So, yeah, complex questions, separating out this question, the source of right, from the prudence or the the, the way in which we might nevertheless act within this claim of right of power. Elizabeth, did you want to say anything? No. Kimberly? Uh, just briefly on that, I mean, when I was rereading Hobbes for the book Liz and I um, uh, put yeah. together a couple of years ago, one of the things that really struck me is that he's one of the few political thinkers who really doesn't in any sense kind of elevate or glorify violence or make it heroic in any kind of way. Mm. And that's one of the reasons why I find him such an interesting thinker. He really, you sense, had an understanding of what fear and pain actually meant. Yeah. Yeah, he's not unique in the list for that, but you're you're right. He's he he doesn't he doesn't celebrate it at all. Timorous. He's yeah. <laughs> okay, moving on to another uh, uprated question it comes from Steve Ballard. It's about um, uh, uh, Kant and his 1781 book Critique of Pure Reason, which you discuss a good deal, and the. The question is really about the the in, you know the, the the argument that Kant made that um, you know there's only one planet that can sustain life in the whole universe as far as we know, and so the overriding goal of, of politics has got to be, uh, and indeed of all human conduct has got to be you know how do we maximise that? And you know you can see some of these themes coming through uh, recently in the debate about you know. Can, can business carry on, you know, uh, advocating a sort of dead planet strategies, which they seem to be hell bent on doing right across the USA and so on. Um, and that at least gives us a kind of an, a, a sort of end to history kind of a rationale for uh, thinking about what we're doing. Um, do you want to, uh, does anybody, any of the three of you really want to comment on, on that question? I mean, in some ways, I think it's quite a hard question to uh, respond to without a bit more sense of the precise 
context of that um, comment, the Kantian uh, comment that's there. Mm. But I think one of the things about about Kant is that he had that very, very strong sense that even though we couldn't know, we had to act as if there could be order, peace, a way of doing things. And I think, you know, that that would be something that um, that he would see as a continuous kind of obligation that we have. So it's not just about the kind of last moment as I think the question appears to imply, but it may be I haven't fully understood what the questioner uh, is getting at uh, there. Um, I mean, if it's a more general question about, well, you know, we're all going to hell in a handbasket, then yes, probably we are. Um, you know, I think <laughs> without to be too much of an Augustinian pessimist myself, I think that's probably true. Elizabeth? Yes. Yeah, so, I, I do think this is a really interesting question from Steve Steve Allard. I'm, I mean, I, I don't think it's fair to think that uh, prof, univers, all university professors on earth, including Professor Kelly, are, as it were, consciously justifying armed conflict for profit. And in fact, I mean, there's, you know, there's a real dose of kind of, uh, Paul doesn't say much about this in his in his um, methodological remarks, but there's a real dose of sort of critical critique here in this book, as well as in Kant's work, which is an inquiry into the presuppositions that we have to, as it were, endorse and take for granted if we're to understand what's going on. So it's not, it's not, as it were, endorsing what's going on. It's asking, you know, why is what is going on going on? How can it be that this is the, the real commonsensical world that we're living in? Now, Kant um, wanted to understand how it was that we could, as it were, know things, uh, come up with ideas like, the idea of perpetual peace, how we could understand judgments of truth and beauty and so on. And he also did think optimistically that there is a possible world in which we reach a kind of, uh, uh, a kind of equilibrium. 20th century and 21st century thinkers do find it much, much harder to endorse that idea. Not the idea of a possible world, but certainly the idea of a probable world. But one of the things that, you know, university professors are trying to do is understand why it is that things are as they are, lamentable, uh, though the way they are might be. So I think I'd want to push back um, at Steve Ballard's presumption in that question about what Paul Kelly and others are actually endorsing as a state of affairs. Paul, just one quick one. Um... What can I say? Uh, Kant is, you know, people who like Kant like Kant. Okay, um, let's move on to just a couple of more sort of, let's uh, take it down towards uh, uh, everyday life a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so one uh, question that comes from Michael White and uh, Phil McPhail really in different forms is about um, the way modern life has shifted towards a sort of information-based uh, civilization, does that change political uh, content at all? Does it change what, you know, intrastate violence means? Is it all about, you know, uh, subverting the other state with misinformation rather than uh, actually physically uh, uh, crossing borders and so on? These, these sorts of issues. How do you think the digital civilizational era that we're pushing deeply into now is going to change these issues. Any views on that? I mean, what, what, so one, one possible framework to think about that is to, is to think about Clausewitz's conception of war mm -hmm. and the inner logic of war 
as one of escalation. Now, you know, I'm, what does Clausewitz think about AI and the you know explosion of inf but he doesn't think about that. But it's one of those examples where you know the idea that you eradicate traditional, particularly interstate or large groups to large group violence by some technological fix. I mean, that's been the reception of you know Clausewitz's work throughout. You know, ah, oh, yeah, but you know the First World War came along and there were machine guns, and therefore, you know, so that's little heart. And then you've got you know after um, you know, the atom bomb and so on, you know, escalation is no longer possible because you know, the, the, the absolute is already there in front of you. I, I think we've managed to carry on quite a lot of pretty high level and vicious conflict with pretty much every technological change we've made. And I, I, I would be, I don't want to be dismissive, but I think that the idea that somehow AI and you know cyber warfare is going to change things massively, no, it just presents a different challenge to your opponent. And one of the insights of, of Clausewitz and one of the things that is important to this idea of political prudence is whatever you think your interest is, confront somebody who has a different interest, an opponent who acts accordingly. And that's true whether we're talking about, you know, the technologization of war or we're back in, you know, the 18th century with armies in colorful uniforms. But if I blow up your nuclear power plant by sabotaging the software, uh, maybe I've uh, evaded responsibility and maybe I can, you know, uh, uh, avoid uh, being held responsible. So maybe we, we get the violence still, but, but it's, it's, it's less high, it's, it's more anomic and, and nobody can really sort of track me down. But given, so given my point is of... only, given we can predict that as a possibility, strategists will be thinking about what do you do with that strategy? What are your safeguards? What are your fallbacks? Who do you hit? And we've also got, you know, 24-7 drones out there easily targeting people. You know, technology always requires you to be in a place. I always like the idea, you know, that the cloud is kind of, oh, the cloud. No, the cloud is a place where there are supercomputers linked and, they, you know, you need a technological and territorially situated place to have things like the cloud. You know, that's what, you know, if we believe the stories about China and Huawei, if we believe, you know, the NSA owning all of all of really controlling all of the US tech industry, that's that's what states do at the moment. Okay. They look at that and the threat and how they counter it. Any thoughts, Kimberly or Elizabeth? So, I mean, I do think, Patrick that if you were to manipulate the algorithm so that their power plant blew up. I, I mean, it, it doesn't seem to me that there is a difficulty uh, pinning responsibility for that. Mm. You know, you don't actually evade responsibility. Of course, it might be hard to track you down um, and you may be well protected so that you can evade justice, but I don't think you can evade responsibility. And I don't think that the new AI, I mean, I think that, you know, some of the kind of concerns about artificial intelligence is that it's taking human agency yeah. out of the picture and therefore response, yeah. you know, there is, we are going to uh, enter a, a, a world of new irresponsibility. Yeah. But I don't think we have to concede that. And I haven't actually seen any developments that look as though we should concede that point. Yeah. Kimberly, any, any thoughts? I suppose just to add to a slightly different angle in terms of the way the question's phrased, I think um, information war and psychological violence um, is an interesting thing to think about. One of the things that's come up in a few of the questions um, is about different types of violence and how we think about yeah. violence. I think in in Paul's book, it tends to be seen in a fairly classical sense involving, uh, you know, kinetic uh, violence between, uh, you know, which is inflicting wounds, etc., on, on people and uh, destroying uh, places. But clearly this raises this broader question about how violence can take different forms. 
and at what point the word violence becomes inappropriate. So it's, it's one of those things Liz and I have struggled with. Um, I don't think there's yeah. any easy answer to it, but I think it's interesting that you use the term psychological violence in the question. Right. Okay, well, look, one final sort of let's bring it down to real life kind of question. Is Brexit uh, utopianist uh, or is it realist? Uh, is it cosmopolitan or, or realist? Or what, 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 what should we think about it? Oh, who, who wants to go first or shall I say? Well, I think, I think I mean, you, you should have I the last word on that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I think Paul should have the last word. I think it's an absolutely brilliant question. Yeah. And I mean, it's, um, it's one that uh, all students should yeah. write an essay about. So there's an interesting story you know, the, the two most important, and I think Quentin Skinner would allow me to say this, the two most significant British scholars of Hobbes, Richard Tuck and Noel Malcolm, are both strong at, were both strong advocates of Brexit. In Tuck's case, it was a kind of Lexit. Um, in Malcolm's case, it's partly a rejection of the Europeanization of conservative ism as a kind of importation of Christian social democracy, kind of, you know, Catholicism all over again. So those two people, and therefore Hobbes, probably do align with the idea of, of the sovereignty argument for Brexit, right, as some kind of juridical claim about ultimate legal and um, legally constituted political authority being, you know, concentrated in one place and not divided and shared. So Hobbes, um, if you go to some of the others, you know, cosmopolitans of various kinds, well, you know, yeah, they think the whole world is uh, you know, a single state, if you like. Um, nearly everybody I think of thinks of politics as in some sense an activity that is limited in its scope. That can be quite a big group that it's limited amongst, um, but it is limited. So uh, they're probably all partly sympathetic to keeping sovereign political power close to home in some way. But Hobbes would be the answer. He'd be the Brexiteer. Great. Well, look, thanks very much indeed, Paul and Kimberly and Elizabeth. It's been a, a fascinating discussion. It's a, a fascinating book. Thank you to the audience for some really brilliant questions. We really appreciated them. And I uh, hope that all of you will uh, go and uh, download the book and, uh, and ponder even further on, on these important issues. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>